I met Giselle Ramon Sauberon on a late morning in March at the San Javier del Bac mission. We were standing in direct Arizona sun, water bottles in hand. Tourists crossed the parking lot near us in shorts and big floppy hats. And it gets hot here. Uh, you know, you have to be smart about living in the desert because otherwise you aren't, you're not gonna survive. Ramon Sauberon is a doctoral candidate wrapping up a dissertation on the history of land and water here on the San Javier Indian Reservation. It's part of the Tahana Otham Nation, and it's a stone's throw from the Tucson city line, about a 20-minute drive from downtown. But it feels farther than that, and a little more rural. I mean, and that's not even for a long time ago. That even goes to today in 2022, when you're out and about, knowing always have water with you, <laughs> making sure... You know, you're checking the temperature, and, and a long time ago, you know, we were smart about that. I'm Megan Myskowski, and this is Tapped, a podcast where we tell our stories, the stories of people living with the cost of drought in the Southwest, and what we can do to mitigate it. In this episode, for centuries, the Huhugam and then the Tahana Otham created systems to get water where they needed it, while still accounting for desert scarcity. Those systems took serious hits as white settlers arrived and built Tucson. Now, members of the Tahana Otham Nation are reincorporating traditional knowledge and land management approaches around water. And they're seeing results. I didn't eat breakfast this morning. <laughs> Giselle Ramon Sauberon is a member of the Tahana Otham Nation. We are actually on the Santa Rita Indian Reservation. Um, this is where I come from. This is my community. It houses many land allotments, mostly farms. Ramon Sauberon says it's been farmland for a very, very long time. We've been farmers for time immemorial in Santa Vera, and we learned from our ancestors, the Huhukam, on how to farm. The Huhukam lived across southern Arizona from 200 AD until about the mid 1400s, about 90 years before the Spanish made it here. The Tahan Otham are their descendants. They were close to rivers like the Salt and the Gila, and here along the Santa Cruz. And those rivers were important. They used to flow wide, especially after a big rain, and farmers could take advantage of that breadth of the river. And about a thousand years ago, that led the Huhugam to build out systems to channel the water. Our ancestors created these intricate, very sophisticated canal systems. And in their time, they had the most extensive and complex system in what we now call North America. These canals were designed to bring water to farms for flood irrigation. And those farms were managed collectively, not split up by owner. The Otham word for Santa Rita is walk, W-A colon K. And it means where the water goes in. And that's in reference to the aquifers because a long time ago in the river by the basin, they discovered that water would essentially disappear and then it would come up somewhere else. And that was the aquifer. The Huhugam and then the Tahana Otham knew and still know well how the water in this area works. There's not a lot of it, and there never has been. But you can make a little go a long way. That was a big part of farming life, but that's also a big part of our way of life. You only take what you need, and being able to have a resource and have it continue on because you got to think about other people, first of all, but also plants and animals and others that need that resource as well. We don't know exactly what happened to the Huhugam, though there are theories that involve drought, disease, migration, and the Tahan Otham have traditional stories reserved for tribal members. The way the Huhugam managed water in the area lived on with their descendants. A lot of times history books get it wrong because they, they make it seem as if native people, specifically Otham, like we didn't know how to live and then the Spaniards came and taught us everything we know. <laughs> and that's not true at all. Yeah. 
Eusebio Kino was a Jesuit priest who first came to the area from Europe in the late 1600s. We've been living here for time immemorial, and you know, when the Spaniards came over, Father Kino came, they didn't know how to live in the desert. A lot of it was us teaching them. Yes, they introduced new things to us, like cattle and horses and metal tools, but again, we knew what grew here. We knew how to live off of the land. Father Kino founded this mission in 1700. He came here you know, with good intentions and a good heart, and I think that's what sometimes people think, oh, you know, um, it was only bad with Spaniards, and it wasn't at first. She says many Tahana Atham felt what he preached about land stewardship and kindness to others meshed well with their own beliefs. This is my favorite place to eat lunch, and uh, you can see the mountains in the background, the Tucson Mountains, you can see the Catalinas, uh, the Rincon Mountains. I also met Sina Shalifli, just around the corner from the mission, on a balcony attached to her office building. She monitors water levels and erosion across San Javier. She also helps plan for floodwaters. From this perch, we can see pretty far across the district. We have maps in front of us, but we almost don't need them. She explains what all we're looking at to me. They're the autumn peas that they grow every winter, so they're yellow now because they're drying out, so they're going to be harvesting them soon. She says part of Father Kino's legacy is getting the word out about Tucson to other Spanish settlers. You know, it's funny reading about Father Kino's writings of the area, and I think he compared it that, oh, uh, this could be a tr metropolis like Mexico City, like thinking that there was that much water here. She says while this area might have looked lush to other desert dwellers, it really wasn't. God, I would compare that to like cities of gold, right? You know, and then it encourages a lot more people to end up moving here. The promise of water brought more settlers, and with more settlers came more government. By the late 1800s, the U.S. government signed what is known as the Dawes Act into law to bring up tribal lands and give portions of it to homesteaders. It was also designed to force Native Americans to assimilate by offering them allotments of land to farm if they agreed to the arrangement. The government ultimately gave the Tahana Atham smaller cuts of the land they already lived on. And the land allotments went to families, not communities. Shalifli showed me on a map. You notice all the allotments are along the river. It's where the water is, where the resources are, and the mining operation that's south of there. So there is strategy around trying to take this land and this particular spot because this is where geologically there's volcanic uh, rocks underground and the water gets held back. Again, the Tahana Atham knew how to manage water in the desert. The settlers used water like they had in the greener places they'd come from, not recognizing it as finite. And you had people start putting reservoirs on the river downstream and cutting deeper ditches, and folks created these ditches. And then when big monsoons came, it just cut that soil all the way back. She showed me a picture of a 30-foot drop of topsoil that was lost to the river. What's left is a dusty wall that reminds me of the side of a canyon, with brittle rocks of all sizes lining it, as if they just fell off. So when that happens, the water table drops, right? Because now water can't be held in this soil. Settlers kept digging wells and introduced water-intensive crops like pecans. There wasn't enough groundwater to come to the surface in San Javier. The flow of water stopped. Farming essentially ceased. Giselle Ramon Sauberon drove me out to a quiet spot near the Santa Cruz River. There were tall trees, making archways and providing shade from the strong sun. So right now where we're at is actually our riparian area. This is our hick done. The Hicton is a restoration area in San Javier. 
And we actually got lucky because I was actually wanting this to be open for us and magically it is. It is. <laughs> Some elders in the community, like Ramon Savaron's grandma, remember coming to play in the water here as kids until it dried up in the 1940s. I can't even fathom like how she's like, yeah, we used to play in it and, you know, and had all these lush trees. As dry as it is here now, it's not as bad as it was in the middle of the 20th century. That's because tribal members pushed back. This is the single most important thing for the whole future of businessmen, working families, everybody in southern Arizona. That's former Congressman Morris Udall. The Tahan Otham sued for water rights in the 70s, and he came back with a bill that would guarantee them those rights. That bill? The Southern Arizona Water Rights Settlement Act, known as SWARZA, was passed in 1982. And you can see the result of it right here at the Hick Den. It's kind of funny because this is what I'm writing about right now <laughs> for my dissertation. And I was working on it last night. She says the lawsuit and the bill were crucial to bringing some water back. You know, we were, we were pretty much making a stance and saying, what you did is not right. And, you know, we want you to understand that and we want you to pay for the damages and the loss that you have caused us. The new law gave San Javier a cut of Colorado River water through the Central Arizona Project. So you started to see them pull from other sources and then probably about 2018, I want to say, is when we actually started to see our groundwater, our aquifers start to run again. And that is something major because, again, I never thought I would see that in my lifetime. Then in the 90s, when Ramon Salveron was a kid, the Tana Otham Nation planted trees and dug a trench to move water around this spot near the river, the Waukikdan. But then when we come down here, they turn the water on and it's flowing around here. And, you know, we have the pond going. Then, you know, once I got older and was able to come down here and see that, it's like, oh, I could make those connections and, you know, in a sense, I put myself, you know, in those stories that my grandma was telling. Back on the porch, Shalifli shows me a map of the river as it flows along the highway. I learned some things the other day, which I had called an elder about to ask. She pulls out some old photos. This is when a huge chunk of the Santa Cruz River fell off. That's just right over here. She says the farm lost about 80 acres over 10 years from floodwaters. This is I-19. This is going north. Um, these are the farm fields right there. So this huge chunk of land fell off. After Swarza, the farmers could work on stabilizing the bank. They put in a training dike and stormwater channels. Well, when I was going back to see when they originally installed this, I noticed all these contours that were here, which is traditional farming techniques. And, and what I understand is the original farm manager who was here, he installed those and seeded them with mesquite trees. They also put in floodwater channels that are designed to deposit sediment here essentially replacing the soil that was lost in those 80 acres. So again, thinking through how to not just move stormwater out of the system, but how to repair land. I mean, that'll take 100 years to make a significant dent in, you know, increasing that sediment, but it's still thinking that long-term, people are gonna be here for, you know, the next, thousand years, right? So that that's the intent to take care of the land and repair it and heal it. And she says if you know where to look, you can see remnants of old water management techniques around Tucson and southern Arizona, like terraces, which look like steps in the ground with rocks lining the vertical sides. These were terraces that were made to slow down water and infiltrate. Sometimes you'll see rock mounds, and that's where agaves would be planted for dryland farming or other crops that just utilize the natural rainfall. She shows me pictures of the modern farm and the historic remnants side by side. That's just a large version of that, right? Using modern tools with heavy equipment. You know, this was done by hand and probably sticks and lots of, lots of hands. <laughs> the rocks form lines that zigzag down a hill. There's lessons in the rocks, right? And so now I look for them everywhere. You know, if, if something looks intentional, it probably was. Shalif Lee says they're getting federal money to keep building this sort of thing, including Biden's Infrastructure Act and COVID relief funds. What's really great 
and encouraging is the federal government is looking at a more holistic approach to watershed management versus just uh, what they call gray infrastructure where they just channel it, but looking at the full watershed. In the car, Giselle Ramon Sauberon and I talk more about her dissertation. Everything we touched, she covers there too. And her research started in her own family. You want to know anything relating to <laughs> land and water? Like Everybody's like, oh, go talk to your Auntie Julie. And she, she was like, I'm not going to be around forever, so I want to have this opportunity to you know, be able to share all of these documents, all these different things with you, and in a way pass the knowledge on to you. Ramon Sauberon is a future Lati, meaning she'll inherit a section of land in San Javier. She put together the story of the land and the water for her use, but also for her daughter and her nieces, and other Lati's that needed it. So she put feelers out in the community of what sort of information people would need. I just didn't want to do something for only my benefit. I don't think like that, you know. She says there are cultural traditions that she believes shouldn't be written down, but after talking with family, decided this should be, because otherwise, it could be lost to time. What's really awesome and makes me really proud to be from Sanavir is looking at all of those historical events that have happened and having those elders, you know, everything that they've done over time and to, to get to where we are and really standing up for what they believed in. And she says that knowing that history is key for her future and other future Latids as they keep trying to make it work in the desert. On the next episode, we talk to an Arizonan who's been trying to do exactly what people have been doing here for millennia, farm. You can't expect farmers to go out on a limb and change everything that they're doing and implement these practices and, and produce all of this stuff with absolutely no guarantee that there's going to be somebody to buy it. Arizona was built on agriculture, but as water dwindles, how is that industry adapting? And how much can it afford to change? This episode of Tapped was reported, written, and hosted by me, Megan Myskowski. Duncan Moon is our editor. Christopher Conover is our news director at AZPM. Zach Ziegler is our production engineer. And JT Thorpe is our fact checker. The music you're listening to is by Michael Greenwald. Visit our website at azpm.org tapped for pictures, links, and more. Oh.